So we've talked about the basics of the atom, and now we're going to look at some ways to represent the atom visually. Specifically, we'll look at the Bohr model. All right, so this is an example of the Bohr model. So we have nucleus in the center. You don't have to be as detailed with all of the protons and the neutrons, uh, but basically we have nucleus in the center and then electrons around the outside. So. As a refresher, how do we determine protons, neutrons, and electrons? Protons can be determined by the atomic number, which is unique to each element. Neutrons can be determined by taking the mass number and then subtracting the protons, also the atomic number. And then the electrons will equal the number of protons if the atom is neutral or if it is uncharged. If it has a charge, then we'll just have to subtract um, that uh, from the protons. Okay, so for the Bohr model, um, in the Bohr models we have a central nucleus. We label it with the number of protons and neutrons. We have then the number of electrons equals the number of protons for any neutral atom. The rings that are on the nucleus, nucleus we will fill with electrons. So the first ring will hold two, the second ring will hold eight, and the third ring will hold eight. We're only going to fill it to eight you may have learned before some different numbers. For our purposes, we are going to pick eight. Whenever you take chemistry, you can look at why that is. The Bohr model, along with other picture representations, but the Bohr model is just one way to represent the electrons, um, but it might not really be the most accurate. However, it helps us to see how the valence electrons are laid out, and I think it helps us to identify how bonding might take place for the atom. And so. For our purposes, I think that it is useful. So here are some examples of the Bohr model. So hydrogen, um, we have our nucleus. You can identify if it has how many protons and how many uh, neutrons it has. In this case, it's saying, okay, we have one proton, one electron. So we have one electron here, which goes in the first energy level. Helium has two, so it has now filled up the energy level. One of the most important ones we'll look at is carbon. So carbon is here, nucleus in the center. It has six protons, which means it has six electrons. So we fill up one, two in the first energy level, and then one, two, three, four. What this means is, is that it has four valence electrons, or four outer electrons, which can be used in bonding. You can look at the other elements that are here and see how many valence electrons that they have. And like I mentioned before, it tells us a lot about how they bond and about how reactive they are. Okay, so looking ahead, we can also talk about isotopes with atoms. So I mentioned this in the other video, but isotopes are atoms that have different numbers of neutrons, which means that they have different mass numbers. So they're still the same element, but we would call it something. So if we had carbon, we'd say it's carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14 which means just that it has a different number of neutrons. Carbon always has six protons, so carbon-12 would have six neutrons, 13 would have seven, 14 would have eight. So naturally, elements exist in a few different forms, and so we average all of those masses together to get the atomic mass number that you see on the periodic table, and that's based on how frequently the isotope Appears in nature. Here's just an example of hydrogen and the isotopes of hydrogen. And so what you can see is, is that it all they all have one proton, but they have different numbers of neutrons. The reason why we look at isotopes is because we can look at carbon, and specifically we look at isotopes because some of them are stable, like carbon-12, and then others of them are unstable, like carbon-14. Carbon-14 is considered to be radioactive, and we can use that for some important things. For isotopes, isotopes will have the same uh, general properties, um, with the exception of some physical properties, so things like mass number, the density, and then their radioactivity or half-life change. There are a few examples for you, so about carbon-12 being stable and carbon-14 having radioactive decay. 
Um, we can use carbon-14 for radioactive dating, uh, which is uh, useful to determine the age of different materials. So the reason why isotopes are radioactive is because with the extra neutron, then it makes the nucleus unstable, and so it makes the nucleus want to kind of break apart. So what happens is, is that the atom will emit radiation or particles, and the nucleus of the atom can then change. The rate at which this happened is what we call a half-life, and um, we can determine basically how long it'll take for about half of a sample to decay, and then it will take that long again for half of that sample to decay. So it takes a really long time, and um, really you never get rid of all of the original. Just some examples of radiation. And then for radioactivity, uh, it can be used in medicine for treating different cancers. It can be no used for radiometric dating, um, using things, looking at the half-life and seeing how much of carbon-14 is found in a sample versus its nitrogen isotope or the nitrogen isotope that's created. And so by looking at kind of the amounts of that and looking at the half-life, we're able to see how old something. So that's how we use isotopes. Hopefully that gives you a little understanding of the Bohr model and is also 